Welcome again. Uh, Transcend offers customized training and technical assistance that covers a wide range of topics including career development and job placement of people with disabilities and folks who have other life challenges, workplace accommodations, benefits counseling, and strategies for complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. In addition, we conduct training and research on school to adult life transition, including transitions to work, post-secondary education and training, and community life. It's been our privilege for the past 25 years to collaborate with organizations, schools, and businesses around the country, as well as Australia, Europe, and Brazil. So we encourage you to visit Transcend's website when you get a chance. In 2010, we partnered with Virginia Commonwealth University to establish the Center on Transition to Employment for Youth with Disabilities. The center is funded by the National Institute for Disability and Rehabilitation Research of the U.S. Department of Education and is charged with conducting six studies pertaining to the preparation of youth and with disabilities for employment. Today, you signed on to hear about one of these studies, the personnel factor, exploring the personal attributes of highly successful employment specialists who work with transition age youth, or as we like to call it, so what makes for a really good employment specialist? If you would, uh, we'd like to know who's on the line by having you complete a poll on the screen. So you're going to see a list come up, and if you would please uh, indicate who you're representing. Looks like we have a number of community-based agency reps, got some educators, government agencies, Okay, not as many employers, but we do have some. That makes them very happy. Good. Fantastic. And a job seeker, or a handful of them. Very good. So 50% of our group are community-based agencies. 23% represent government groups. 20, 21% of you are working with educational institutions or schools. Thank you. And then we want to ask, which one of the following best describes your professional role. Do you provide direct service, manage staff, train staff, develop and evaluate programs, or develop policy related to programs? And certainly we assume some of you wear many hats on one little head, but it looks like at this point we've got a number of direct service providers on the phone and then, and then some management. Okay, some trainers, some evaluators, and some policy folks. All right, so it looks Great. like the majority of you are folks that work directly with job seekers, and about 30% uh, of you manage uh, those direct service staff. So thank you. We also know from looking at our registration list that all of you come from diverse organizations from around the country, and I believe we also have Puerto Rico with us. And before we get uh, deeper into our webinar, we'd like to cover some basic logistics to make uh, your online experience as enjoyable as possible. And since we have over 420 participants uh, that signed up for the webinar, all the lines will be muted throughout. However, at any time, please feel free to use the question feature on your screen. Just type any comments or questions that you have, and we'll do our best to address them as we go along. Now, some of you are probably familiar with the TV show Top Chef, and throughout each episode, the contestants are given a quick fire challenge, and they get surprised with a couple of ingredients, and they're given a few minutes to create a dish. Now, we're not going to ask you to cook in this quick fire challenge, but we will be throwing out some polling questions throughout. So here's the first one. From a recent national survey of employers, what percentage of them said they actively recruit people with disabilities? Okay. All right, the votes are coming in here. It looks like the top vote from you all was 
followed then by uh, 30 percent. That's 14. I'm sorry, 14 percent, excuse me, 14 percent, which is in fact uh, the, the answer from, from the poll. 14 percent of employers that were, were uh, surveyed said they actively recruit people with disabilities. Right, and certainly that's more than 7 percent, which is the, the, the first choice for many of you. But um, George, since this means that the remaining 86 percent of employers are not actively recruiting, uh, job seekers with disabilities, it's all the more important that we maximize the effectiveness of our job development strategies and approaches um, to, to meet the needs of all the employers. We have four main goals for today's webinar, and we'd like to explain how we did the study and highlight our findings. We'd also like to talk about what the findings might mean for you and your organizations. Are there practical implications for the field? And finally, we want to invite your reactions, comments, and uh, any thoughts you might have about the study itself. Do you think the most effective employment professionals are born or made? Um, it's interesting, it looks like about half of you think that uh, job developers, effective employment specialists are, are made, that these are acquired skills. Um, the other half uh, seem to think it's a combination of inherent skills and things that you learn. And, um, and a small percentage of you think you would know job, effective job developers are born, that it's something that you're born with. Here's some food for thought um, from a focus group of CEOs and upper level managers. Uh, who were asked whether they believed that the success, success of their salespeople was due to an inborn talent for sales or a learned skill. Well, one third believed that people are born with a natural ability to succeed in sales. Another third felt it was a skill that one acquires. And the remaining uh, third said that they felt it was a combination of both. So I think we see a some similar thoughts going on here. No, oh, absolutely. George, before you get in, before George gets into describing our study, I want to set the stage a little bit. We certainly aren't the first group of uh, researchers to explore job development practices and uh, of professionals. Um, there are a few existing studies out there. Our friends at the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston conducted a survey to investigate the strategies and competencies of job developers working in community rehabilitation programs. Their findings probably will not surprise you. They found that many of the most highly recommended job development practices were not implemented consistently. For example, more of the respondents indicated that they relied on cold calls and browsing help wanted ads rather than networking with family members or employers, despite the fact that the literature indicates that employers tend to hire candidates who are connected through, um, or you know, who are connected through networks of acquaintances, and, and yet those aren't the practices that uh, job developers rely on. At Transcend, we were really interested in what distinguishes uh, effective and non-effective job developers. We wondered if we might be able to identify types of job developers based on those preferred strategies that they employ, and uh, as well as their perceptions of the employment process. So in 2011, and again in 2012, we collaborated with Dr. Ellen Fabian at the University of Maryland, as well as the Heldridge Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers University. We conducted our own national survey of employment service providers. In this survey, we measured the attitudes towards employers and the employment process with a final sample size of more than 500 participants. When we analyzed the, the data using a factor analysis strategy, we were able to um, identify three distinct categories or types of job developers. And um, we labeled those as, number one, as relationship builders. The second um, category of job developers or the type of job developer that we were able to identify, we named supply-siders. And the third group were traditionalists or job brokers. Um, the relationship builders tended to market trust and mutuality in job development and placement. They relied a lot on their strong, the strength of their relationships and their reputation when interacting with employers. Um, conversely, the supply-siders tended to emphasize selling disability, and, and I, I anticipated addressing employer barriers and concerns. 
these are folks that tended to focus on preparing the individual for employment and getting them ready to get to go through the, the hiring process. That last group, the traditionalists, they relied more on moral and legal imperatives to encourage uh, employers to hire. So these are the folks that promoted tax incentives and discussed charitable motivations of employers to hire. So we were able to identify, by, based on their responses to our survey, these three categories. The one limitation of the study was that the job developer types were based on their own perceptions of employers and the employment process, rather than personal attributes of the participants themselves. We did find one study that explored personal attributes of job developers. In 2010, Whitley, Kostick, and Bush interviewed 22 employment specialists who work for mental health providers. Uh, by interviewing them and, and, and sifting through their data, they identified uh, eight predominant attributes. They labeled these as initiative, outreach, persistence, hardiness, empathy, passion, team orientation, and professionalism. So they identified eight that they thought these, this, these are the attributes that make up someone who is an effective job developer. While these three studies add to the dialogue and literature on personal characteristics of employment specialists, or in other words, as George said at the beginning, what, you know, what makes a good employment specialist, these studies didn't identify the placement and retention outcomes achieved by these individuals. For example, in the Whitley et al. study, the participants were recruited based on the reputation and outcomes of their respective agencies rather than their own individual placement outcomes. So the agency was good, had strong outcomes, so they recruited participants from a strong agency. Um, they weren't able to identify whether or not those individual job developers uh, were effective. And so we really wanted to add that element, and so we made sure to only interview um, staff for our study that were top performing professionals at their given agencies. And George will tell you a little bit more about that when we describe the study a bit further. Before we began our study, we had um, an assumption that, the, that effective employer representatives had the skills to perform the required tasks associated with their jobs. Uh, by the way, when we use the term employer representative, that is what the Marriott Foundation Bridges School to Work calls its employment specialists, so we'll use that term interchangeably. We refer to the tasks of job development as the mechanics. So these include skills, um, and these include skills such as assessing the job seeker, creating relationships with community employers, helping to match youth and work opportunities, and providing workplace support to the youth as needed. We'd like to ask you to share some examples of how you approach these four major tasks. So I'm going to pause after, after I e ask each of these questions to allow you time to use your question feature and respond. So let's kind of go over those tasks. Uh, what are some ways that you assess skills of job seekers? Go ahead and take a moment to, to chat. Great. I see some people saying that they interview their, their candidates use vocational assessments, functional assessments. Fantastic. Using the discovery process, using skills inventories, absolutely. A positive personal profile, a personality profile. Great. These are great examples. Okay. I'm going to ask you again to share some um, examples of this time. Oh, are there more? So you guys are you guys are oh you guys are giving us so many great ones. Okay, I want to take a moment. We got to write them all down. Here. Yeah. Work trials. Um, Determining skills and ability. Uh, given the uh, time imperative of caseload in Australia, this is limited, so mm -hmm. it's an observation. Well, it's also, that's exciting because we have somebody from Australia <laughs> participating. That's <laughs> exciting in itself. Um, Great. Okay, fantastic. And I see some examples of some formal assessment tools. Some, and some informal tools um, and, and many different examples. So we're going to ask you again uh, another question. What are some ways that you um, create relationships with community employers? What are the strategies that you employ to do that? Again, I'll pause and give you a moment to use the question feature. A 
request to repeat the question. So what I'm asking is, what are some ways that you create relationships with community employers? So I see some examples here. We ask for tours. We use person-to-person -person outreach. We invite, uh, we host community events. Mm -hmm. Community involvement, including organizational memberships, um, using, go, uh, being involved in the area chamber, commerce, youth councils, um, just visiting businesses as much as possible. Um, not just as a developer, but as a customer. Social networking. Social networking. Great, great. Okay, these are all fantastic. How about um, the third question? What are some strategies that you use to help match youth to work opportunities? How do you take what you've learned and match youth to, or job seekers to work opportunities? Interest, interest inventory, so sort of matching interest and the job needs, knowing your client base. Oh, jo short-term job experiences, informational interviewing, okay, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Okay, there's some, there's some great, it's hard to keep up because as we said, there's over 400 people um, registered for this, so this is a great sort of sampling of, um, of all, lots of different strategies. And then the last sort of major mechanics or job tasks that job developers are often um, responsible for is um, providing workplace support. So would you um, share some examples about how you provide workplace support? Okay, uh, using natural supports, um, short-term job coaching, uh, using preparing clients with job readiness skills so that they're successful. Um, Meeting regularly with, with the, staff. the staff and with the employers. Modeling, awesome. excellent. Oh, and peer mentoring training, fantastic. Um, so, as I said, we're watching these come up on the screen and they're just coming up one after another. It's almost hard to keep track of it because you guys are giving us such great examples. Um, and so what I'm, I'm left with wondering is, it's, or, or noticing is how uh, different the approaches that individual, the individuals are offering. And so I, I wondered why, why we believe that we all have such varying strategies and approaches. Um, you know, in the previously described study, in which we just identified types of job developers, our preliminary findings indicate that distinct types exist. If you remember, I talked about relationship builders, supply siders, and traditionalists. And we found those variations among professionals within the same organization. So they had presumably been exposed to similar training opportunities, have similar expectations, processes, et cetera. Um, so perhaps, although some of what we do can be taught and, and created by the structure in which we work, some of it is who we are, that, that who we are is an important part of how successful we are at our job. By raising the bar for the quality of service delivery, it's critical that we identify professionals which are, um, who are likely to be able to meaningfully acquire these competencies. Are there personal attributes that will enable the individuals to be successful, to not just perform the mechanics of the job, but to do the job well? So rather than just performing the task and doing a paint-by-numbers Mona Lisa, there's something that distinguishes those of us that are able to <laughs> create an artistic masterpiece, masterpiece, right? A number of entities, such as the Association for Persons in Supported Employment, otherwise known as APSI, Training Resource Network, Council on Rehabilitation and Education, the Division on Career Development and Transition, uh, Marriott Foundation, and also the National Collaborative on workforce and disabilities for youth have all developed lists of competencies that set this bar high for the quality of service delivery for each of these job development tasks. And numerous ent entities, Transcend included, offer training and certifications and aspects of job development. In recent months, many of you have probably heard more and more about the ABSI established Certified Employment uh, Support Professional exam. So we are moving towards not just completing the task, by achieving a high level of quality service delivery, and we're very interested in figuring out well, who, who can do that and how do we get them there. To that end, um, 
we had a, a theory that we based this, this on. We posed the question early in the uh, webinar, are effective employment specialists born or made? And if I recall, about half of you thought that it was a combination of being born and made. Many of you thought it was something that you could acquire. Our theory was that effective employment professionals, including the Bridges staff in our study, may have, a certain, may have had certain attributes or characteristics that enable them to more easily acquire essential skills and competencies. So we based that on our prior work with employment specialists, theories of career development, and certainly our own experiences as job developers. You know, many of us have stories that we share with job seekers about how we found our chosen careers. Uh, for me, I used to tell my students that I always wanted to be a rock star. I love to perform, to be around people, to be creative. Um, problem is, it turns out that I lack one of the necessary attributes to musical superstardom, which is um, a pretty important one, it's having a good singing voice. Um, this is really totally relevant when we talk about having the requisite personal attributes to not only do a job, but to do it well. So I'm still relatively fond of performing and would happily start singing into the speakerphone to the horror of my children, probably. Um, and uh, although I would assume you would all agree that I could probably sing every word any country song that's on the radio these days, I wouldn't be doing it very well. And because of that limitation in my own personal attribute, my inherent lack of a good singing voice would get in the way of me doing the job well. I could do it. I could sing all the words. I wouldn't be doing it very well. You're still a rock star in my book. Oh, thank you very much, yes. On the other side of the coin, I'm going to talk about someone that is good at what they do. Um, we have folks like Jimmy Graham. He's an NFL pro bowler uh, that some of you may know. Uh, after playing four years of college basketball, Jimmy decided to try out for the University of Miami football team while taking graduate classes. Imagine that. Just I'm going to, I'm going to try a new sport. Um, despite limited football experience and having been described as having sloppy footwork, Professional scouts recognized his raw athleticism, and he was drafted by the New Orleans Saints in the third round of the 2010 NFL grant, uh, draft. Mr. Graham's story can be juxtaposed against those of the thousands of young men who attend the elite training programs, practice tirelessly, and never make it to the NFL. When I heard this story, when I heard about Mr. Graham, I immediately thought of all the dozens of youth that identify being an NFL player as their career goal. I'm sure many of you on the call have talked to those kids. You say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a football player. Um, so why is it that our youth often don't reach that goal and uh, Mr. Graham was able to succeed? It's obvious that Mr. Graham had many of the desirable attributes of a great athlete. Uh, maybe it was speed, agility, strength, which enabled him to acquire the specific skills to be a great football player. Maybe it's the running certain routes or the, you know, I don't know, play calling. I'm not sure. What's of perhaps most interest to us is that some very astute professional scouts were able to recognize these attributes in him and groom him to acquire those specific skills. You know, during this study, I had a rather blatant aha moment. Um, I thought back to how often I have talked about the importance of soft skills for the workplace. We all know that it's easier to teach our job seekers how to do a specific job skill than it is to teach them the importance of reliability and working hard. You know, the same is true for job development professionals. We believe it's easier to teach them how to perform the mechanics of job development. So many of you thought that as well, good job development was, was, was taught or made. But that there are personal attributes that are at least as, at least as important for becoming an effective uh, job developer. Going into our study, we were also mindful that while employment specialists play a pivotal role in helping the youth in the study find and keep their jobs, that there were other, uh, there were other factors at play that we have to acknowledge. The youth were all individuals with unique characteristics, strengths, needs, and circumstances. They all came to the project, so much as your clients and consumers and job seekers probably do, with diverse backgrounds and experiences, as well as diverse attitudes and belief systems. Um, in addition to the youth themselves, their families uh, and their living environments are unique. Uh, you know each family has its own set of unique dynamics. Um, there are also other factors that, that we would be remiss without mentioning that can positively or negatively impact outcomes. Geography, you know, where are the jobs located in relation to where a person lives? Neighborhood challenges. In this study, we, we heard again and again about youth who lived in crime-ridden neighborhoods, and so it was, it was difficult to find jobs that were safe to get to. Uh, transportation, uh, economic trends in the community, a whole host of other external factors that are obviously, um, you know, important to consider. 
so here's a brief overview of the methodology that we used for our study. We recruited 17 staff uh, who had placement and retention outcomes that exceeded the historic top average outcomes for their particular site. And for these interviews, we developed a protocol or a guide of sorts that covered a number of key areas. And these areas included the professional background of the uh, uh, interviewee, their roles and responsibilities, how they collaborate with families, community partners, and colleagues, what they felt were the perceived youth factors as far as successful placement and retention, uh, what professional development they had participated in, their perceptions of program leadership and support, and finally their personal life philosophy. It was uh, very important to us that the employer reps feel comfortable and upfront with us. So our questions were structured in a way that encouraged dialogue, allowed us to pursue more detail on certain topics, and really to get a lot of real life examples to illustrate the points that uh, these folks were making. For each interview, we had two researchers on the call asking questions and taking, uh, taking the notes. And uh, our notes included the verbatim responses, as well as our impressions of the feelings and attitudes that were expressed by the interviewees related to the specific topics. So in all, we had about uh, 23 hours of audio recordings, which we then transcribed into several hundred pages of notes. Combined with our written notes, that certainly was a lot of text. So we used a number of qualitative research techniques to organize uh, those data, collapse and categorize, and, and then finally to interpret those data. And one very helpful tool that we used was a software program some of you might be familiar with called InVivo, which allows you to electronically code and sort vast amounts of text so that we could then analyze trends in the data and begin to see emerging trends. So here's a quick fire challenge for you. What do you think are the top qualities that an employment specialist must have in order to achieve high job placement and retention outcomes? So before we give you our uh, findings, we want to know from you. We're talking about qualities of the person, not necessarily the skills. Use your question feature to type in your so empathy, sense of humor. Good personal presentation. Being outgoing, bubbly personality, attention to detail. A number of outgoing. Wow. Empathy, trustworthy. trustworthy. <laughs> Persistence. <laughs> Professionalism. Uh, willing to take a challenge, determined. Flexible. Mm -hmm. Sincerity ability to communicate with a diverse population, flexible, boldness. I like it. Common sense. Adaptable. Adaptable. These are fantastic. Versatile. Mm -hmm. Well, let's write these down. Yeah, all right. Okay, good. We've done our study. A problem right, solver yeah. patient. Thank you very much. Let's talk about the four attributes that we found in our, in our study. After all that analysis, uh, four attributes emerged. And we're going to identify them first and then discuss each one. The first was something we called principled optimism, then cultural competence, followed by business-oriented professionalism, and networking savvy. And I'll just say right now that a lot of uh, what you, just, you defined in your, your list that you just gave us was certainly captured in these four major attributes. Yeah, absolutely. When we first sat down with all of that text that George was describing, we probably had a list that started off with, you know, 100 attributes. And then our, our challenge was to whittle it down to um, something manageable and try to figure out, are there some categories that, that sort of encompass some of those characteristics? Um, the, next, the first one that, um, that we want to talk to you about is something that we dubbed as principled optimism. We define principled optimism as having the genuine belief in the capabilities of the job seeker, as well as having the feeling a, a sense of responsibility to empower them and positively impact those outcomes. So it's, it's, a, it's a complicated you know, definition. Let me break it apart. There's two parts to it, right? You hear uh, principled, the first word. There um, are uh, participants, two or one, 
ta uh, demonstrated a sense of um, moral obligation to sort of empower youth. There were a lot of folks that talked about religious commitments or moral commitments. Um, a number of them talked about having shared experiences with, with the youth job seekers. A number of them talked about having grown up in impoverished communities themselves or having their own barriers to employment, and so they felt sort of this calling to do this work. Um, but the folks weren't just morally strong. There wasn't just sort of a, you know, I believe that I should do good stuff feeling. They truly believed, uh, seemed to believe that um, it, in the talent of the youth with whom they worked. In order to uncover these talents, the participants took great care to know each, to get to know each of the youth as a unique individual. It went beyond sort of the standard required assessment processes for their organization. Uh, the employer reps spoke of the importance of spending time with the youth in a variety of settings, establishing rapport and trust. They made statements that indicated um, a high degree of empathy and respect for the participants with whom they worked, um, as well as their families, might I add. Uh, the connection to the youth was also evident when these employer reps described their personal sense of satisfaction when the youth would be successful. It was, um, I mean, it was really sort of joyful. They would talk with such pride about the successes of the, the youth with whom they worked. Um, it was obvious that it was, it, was, it was a very powerful experience for them as well. Their optimism was also evident in uh, their high degree of self-efficacy. Well, basically, self-efficacy refers to um, one's sense of personal uh, ability to influence what happens in, in their life, so I believe I can impact the outcomes. And um, these employer reps really believed that they could impact their, these youth lives. They were optimistic. They, they didn't get caught up in all of the challenges. The employer reps in our study seemed to believe that they had um, the ability and the responsibility to help youth find competitive employment. Um, and rather than being deterred by some of those obstacles that we described before, uh, the neighborhood poverty, you know, disability factors, um, they viewed those challenges as opportunities. The, the predominant sentiment we kept hearing again and again was, um, okay, this is what's, what's going on. Let's Let's figure out a solution. Let's figure out what we do with what we have. Thanks, Monica. Uh, the second attribute, um, cultural competence. Uh, well, in our conversations with these employment specialists, we heard a lot of examples that indicated that these professionals have a high degree of cultural competence. Uh, it certainly applied to what we usually think of when we hear the term culture, race, ethnicity, language, uh, family heritage. But it was also uh, more than that. We were drawn to a definition of culture by Stephen Chamberlain, who found that uh, culture were included the values, norms, and traditions that affect how individuals of a particular group perceive, think, interact, behave, and make judgments about their world. And we define cultural competence as having an awareness of the context in which uh, these youth live and the ability to communicate effectively with them and their families. Uh, the professionals in our study demonstrated a commitment to learning about each youth as an individual and really appreciating the settings and circumstances in which those youth live. And further, the, the staff expressed an understanding of the interconnectedness of cultural factors and how that could possibly influence the job placement and retention process. For example, if youth live in a high crime neighborhood with gang activity, there might be a fear of moving through certain areas to get to work. One uh, staff member spoke of a youth who claimed to be living with different relatives when in fact she was in and out of a shelter. Certainly that had an impact on this young woman's ability to uh, prepare for and get to job interviews. And uh, as the staff person put it, in some ways, the job interview is the least of her problems, but still, you know, having a job would help her get her own place to live. Uh, th throughout our discussions, we had the sense that these interviewees were very committed to forming trusting relationships with the youth and their families, and several mentioned their enjoyment at working with people from different backgrounds, uh, as Monica had said earlier, uh, people from different backgrounds because it gave them multiple perspectives and insights. And one person even said working with this diverse group of youth forced her to challenge her assumptions. A quick fire challenge for you. The question is, at this very moment, I am focused solely on this riveting presentation. I am listening and doing work. I am holiday shopping online. 
Well, I suppose if they're holiday shopping online, oh, oh we've got to come on this, folks. I was going to say they won't even hear your question. But. Uh, this is a very honest bunch. I know. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> That's great. Maybe I could send them my list. I'm not right. done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, the third attribute that we're going to describe is the one that we dubbed as business-oriented professionalism. The employment specialist in our study had a broad range of backgrounds, as many of the folks on the film do as well. Um, they had broad range of backgrounds, education, career paths, and yet they all seemed to share a sense of business-oriented professionalism. We defined this as understanding what motivates businesses, as well as having a commitment to high personal standards for professional behavior that mirrors effective business practices. Again, there are two parts to this definition. The first, uh, understanding what motivates businesses. It was interesting that many of the employment reps in the study described previous work histories that included jobs in other sectors and industries, and not just in sales and marketing, but in other industries. So job development trainings often tout the importance of focusing on employer needs, but I guess this assumes that you understand what an employer needs, and if you have, aren't familiar with workplace, businesses, and culture, it may be harder to be responsive to employers' needs. So it was interesting that these folks had a, a, a wide range of backgrounds. One um, participant in our study said, when meeting employers, I try to find out what their needs are, find out what's going to make their job or life easier. That's basically what it's about. They are, um, they are in it to make money. They aren't a social services company. Uh, they aren't here to help. And we just couldn't agree more. The second part of that definition has to do with the high degree of professional contact held by our participants. They, we were um, consistently impressed by the sense of professionalism described. Of note was that many of them described working long hours and focusing on sort of doing whatever it takes, having a real outcome orientation. Um, I need to have this many you know, uh, interactions with employers this week, so I had to stay late because as opposed to, you know, the day was over, it's time to clock out. Uh, when we presented our preliminary findings to the Bridges staff and we talked about some of, our, some, some of those, th those attributes, one of the site directors said that he believed the most important piece of this was time management. And um, certainly we saw um, a high degree uh, or a, a strength in the ability to prioritize job tasks and managing the workload. Um, as I said before, we really noticed a, a real outcome orientation for these folks, uh, a focus on getting the work done rather than logging the hours, and they, and they would talk about that consistently. Um, there were a couple of sort of standout quotes for me that really illustrate that. Uh, one of our participants said, I set aside every Friday for paperwork. As for job development, I have a goal to meet new employers every Thursday. Lots of lists and lots of calendars. Only interviews and emergencies interfere with the schedule. Um, and that sort of very organized, prioritized way to manage our caseload was definitely an example of this business-oriented professionalism. Um, to, the, to speak about an organization, another, another participant said, organization is the key. I maintain a binder with all information about the activities I have been involved in. Every day I review the notebook and specifically track my activities. So again, um, a, a pretty high degree of uh, professional conduct and, and, and accountability for these folks. Our work is characterized by the many relationships that we're required to establish and maintain, and this requires the fourth attribute, which we call networking savvy. And we defined it as the ability to connect with people and resources to create and access opportunities for youth and employers to achieve specific, tangible, and measurable results. So what I want to emphasize there, it wasn't just a question of connecting with people, but it was connecting with people for a purpose that had uh, a tangible outcome. And the employment specialists in our study demonstrated networking savvy through the descriptions they gave us of creative strategies that they used to identify possible opportunities um, when things, times they had to negotiate mutually beneficial arrangements or partnerships mm -hmm. and to collaborate with others. And certainly, networking savvy is essential if you're going to identify and approach potential employers. Um, most of the employment specialists we interviewed gave examples of their active participation in business groups and networks, uh, such as local chambers of commerce and Rotary Club and others. In some cases, uh, we found that there were staff who actually served actively on committees within these business organizations, um, further, I think, illustrating their, their leadership. But, of course, networking savvy also extends further out into the community. 
the staff gave us a lot of scenarios where they had coordinated with contacts with other organizations to meet the many needs of the youth on their caseloads, addressing issues as varied as um, dealing with Social Security benefits, finding a place to live, uh, passing the GED, uh, or mediating disputes between the youth and someone else. Immigration find, immig issues. Immigration issues, and as something as basic as finding suitable clothes to wear for an interview. And most often, of course, these needs were identified early on, but there were many times when these needs came up unexpectedly, and the uh, employment specialists had to respond right away, and their ability to reach out to their contacts quickly was uh, critical. And so what is it about successful employer representatives or employment specialists that demonstrate their networking savvy? And one interviewee put it this way, uh, you have to be able to tap into the collective wisdom of the community. There's a lot of people out there doing good things. We need to know them and help each other. And we came across a nice quote from the author Deborah Zack, where she defines networking as the art of building and maintaining connections for shared positive outcomes, and we certainly agree with that. You know, the goal for all of us are these sort of shared positive outcomes, and so we really um, were interested in trying to understand what are all the things that come into play uh, as we work towards those outcomes. At the beginning of our time together, uh, we summarized the competencies or mechanics of job development as including activities that fall into four major categories. If you can sort of think all the way back, we talked about discovery and assessment activities, building employer relationships, job matching, and facilitating workplace supports. And you'll see that on the graphic below, um, on, on the screen. Um, those were the mechanics or the specific tasks that folks usually associate with job development. In this study, though, we were seeking to identify the core attributes or personal characteristics that would serve as the foundation, sort of hold up these skills, um, and that would enable individuals to acquire these competencies. As we, as, excuse me, as we've described, we identified four that we thought really captured it. We described them as principled optimism, business-oriented professionalism, cultural competence, and networking savvy. Now we want to kind of take a couple minutes and, and hear from you your thoughts about our conclusions. We really want to know if you think that we captured the important characteristics, important um, personal attributes of a successful job developer. Do you think we missed any? Um, do you think that ours, you know, are sufficient? We'd love to hear from you and just give you a moment or so to use your question feature and give us some feedback. And since many of you were uh, paying attention to this riveting presentation, you should be right at the ready to share, to share your ideas. And I also want to mention that we will compile the responses that we received today from you and send them out through, uh, through email to you. And I want to take this moment, we've had a few questions about the availability of the slides. And since we are recording this uh, presentation, it will be up on our website in January and available for you there. Great. So far, people seem to think that we've captured, um, I hear a lot of yeses. Um, somebody said spot on. There's a few um, creative problem solving, and maybe, and maybe you don't feel like that was captured in, in, in one of ours. Here's a, a question um, someone asked. Uh, did one core attribute seem to be more important or influential than the others? That's a very good question. It's a really good think, question, Mark? and I think as we start talking about sort of our next steps, it'll be really, uh, that's something we could explore. I mean, certainly when we did sort of our member check and we went back to the folks and we said, what do you think? Do you think we captured it? Um, the site director, that one, kept saying it's organization, it's organization. You know, all of the other stuff. You know, it doesn't matter if you can't prioritize. And there were people, too, who talked about uh, the, the whole idea of conscientiousness and, and, and sort of how driven people were. And I think that kind of cuts across a lot of those um, attributes. You know, it's funny. Somebody asked specifically, um, the question says, given that a disability employment services trip out employer relationship building from the consultant role, so what, um, how, does this, how does this apply to us? So we understand that we've got people all over the country in various organizations that have varying different roles. Um, and what the folks that were involved in our study were generalists, right? They were involved in job development and then had to provide some initial job support. And so um, we described categories that we thought in, that were important for someone that had to perform all those tasks. One of the things that we thought about was that if, um, in terms of how do you apply this is, is talking about sort of um, 
distinguishing job responsibilities, right, George? About you know, so if you if you have folks on your staff that are particularly you know have a real sense of optimism, real strong level of cultural competence, but maybe don't feel as comfortable, aren't don't necessarily have the networking savvy that some of your other colleagues um, exhibit. How could you sort of split up your job tasks? How can you share the case the caseload? And so I think that um, the same applies when we've got you know. Um, we have professionals that are really performing a piece of the job. Certainly, there's going to be attributes that are most important given your respective responsibilities. We did have uh, someone asked a question about. Uh, they asked if we would give our definition of cultural competence again, and uh, we had two. One was uh, by a gentleman named Stephen Chamberlain, who said it was the values, norms, and traditions that affect how individuals of a particular group perceive, think, interact behave and make judgments about their world. We'll have this in our article that's being published. So you can, you can get the uh, information from uh, a research brief that will be published on our website. It's actually currently on our website. So all of these definitions are in there for you. Um, and just as the, sort of the layman's term for, a cult for a cultural competence, we really were interested in whether or not the, f the folks understood the context with it that the individuals lived. Um, Okay. Right. Well, for our webinar, we did a search of diverse job announcements. We thought this might be interesting to see the various ways that companies describe the characteristics that they look for in prospective candidates. And this was a very creative one that we found from a media company. Uh, for qualifications, they were looking certainly for specific technical competencies, use of software tools, uh, and so forth. They also stated they wanted someone who was organized, motivated, a good communicator. That's pretty standard. They hope to find someone who is forward thinking and a problem solver. Those also are pretty standard. But what caught our attention was their description of the core attributes for the person taking this position. And I want to read the quote. We recruit for force of intellect, reflected in discipline and rigor of thought as manifested often in exceptional academic performance. We look for a personal spirit of generosity a natural disposition towards service and selfless conduct. The candidate must be adaptable and willing to approach tasks with velocity and a high metabolism. <laughs> I thought that was very creative, and that is a, is a creative um, uh, job announcement from, from a business. And we don't know about you, but we thought this was a very unique way of defining core attributes. Um, and suggests that we are really on the right track, that other industries recognize the value of hiring employees who exhibit personal attributes that will enable them to require the um, job-specific competencies and ultimately be successful. The uh, National Institute for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, which, which funded this project, is interested in knowing how the findings from our study might be of use to the field in general. Um, we have some ideas. Uh, we also wanted to give you a moment to weigh in. Um, so if you would use your question tool. If you, uh, one last time. <laughs> one last time. If you think that these findings have practical implications uh, for your work or the field in general, we'd love to hear some of your ideas. Someone says could be used for professional development. Uh, helping me to uh, hire the right person for the job, so possibly maybe as a, a tool for screening people. And, and specifically, someone said scripting interview questions to really sort of help with that process. Developing trainings, tailor some interview questions towards these attributes. Uh, absolutely, we are evaluating our staff expectations, and this oh. is very helpful. I like this one, evaluate what attributes you have and which ones you need to make stronger, so sort of as a self-reflection. That's interesting. Very nice. Um, someone says they didn't think that this applied to our field. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to read that one. Well, that's uh, very uh, honest, uh, especially helpful when various agencies need to collaborate. Oh, yeah. Uh, helping with performance reviews and evaluations, oh. maybe uh, creating performance benchmarks and so forth. Oh, they can also help be used in helping someone determine which agency to choose for job support, um, so Good. the job seeker themselves. That's, Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, we are looking at uh, possibly doing some further study. Of course, this was an exploratory study. 
Um, we were thinking we'd like to conduct the same study in a variety of settings and organizations, um, certainly use some comparison groups, comparing high achieving employment specialists with those who may have lower or marginal outcomes. Um, and as some of you alluded, uh, perhaps developing some sort of a scale or instrument to measure these attributes and then conduct a validation study. How accurately does the scale measure these attributes? And uh, more importantly, can an instrument be developed that helps organizations find and, and uh, keep talented in, uh, employment professionals, screening, recruiting, hiring, training, supporting? Yeah. Well, folks, uh, this wraps up our webinar. Uh, uh, we, before we close, certainly give you one other chance if you'd like to, to make uh, any other comments. Um, we are really pleased that you would join us on a couple of days before the, before the holiday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, to paraphrase something we asked earlier, we asked if you believe highly effective employment professionals are born or made. Uh, I think we all agree that it's a combination of both. Good. We have a, a number of uh, comments here. Uh, some people uh, said, well, we can come, come to where they are and do some, do some training. Um, Uh, the short answer is <laughs> yeah. Great. And I tell you what, we will again, we're going to compile information that you all provided us and get that back um, out to you. I believe there's a survey, an automatic an electronic survey, that we will be emailing all of you shortly uh, and we'd love to get your feedback on the presentation. Um, so thank you all so very much and you have our email addresses there. Feel free to contact us through email and also uh, visit our website where, again, you can find the, the research brief that uh, describes the, the study. Thank you all.